Okay, let, let's go ahead and get started tonight. I um, want to welcome you to Endoscopy Now and today's virtual panel discussion on duodenoscope advances to reduce infectious transmissions, sponsored by AMBU. My name is Mark Angel, and I will be your moderator for today's session. So I want to start off today by um, introducing today's speaker and panelists. We have Dr. Douglas Adler, Dr. Todd Barron, and Dr. David Lichtenstein. Before our panel begins, Dr. Adler will provide a brief presentation to introduce the topics to be discussed. Dr. Adler is the co-director of the Center for Advanced Therapeutic, Therapeutic Endoscopy at Porter Adventist and Peak GI in Denver, Colorado. He received his medical degree from Cornell University, completed internal medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and completed both a general GI fellowship and a therapeutic endoscopy fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He then returned to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center for a fellowship in endoscopic ultrasound. While tenured professor and director of therapeutic endoscopy at University of Utah School of Med Medicine Huntsman Cancer Center, Dr. Adler focused his clinical education and research efforts on the diagnosis and management of patients with gastrointestinal cancers and complex gastrointestinal disease with an emphasis on therapeutic endoscopy. We wanna thank everyone for their time, for joining us today. And Dr. Adler, the floor is now yours. That's great, thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. It's very good to be up here with uh, Todd and David. And I appreciate all of you for attending the, the seminar and the session with us. So I'm gonna be talking about duodenoscope advances to reduce infectious transmission, obviously a major problem that everyone has had a, a very, very rapid education on in the past four or five years. Um, here's my disclosure slide, just so we get that out of the way. And obviously ERCP has been and really remains the first line endoscopic treatment for pancreatic or biliary disease. Duodenoscope related infectious transmission has probably always been with us to some extent, but is now widely recognized and was probably previously grossly underreported. People just really didn't know or they didn't put, put it all together. And we know that there's a wide range of organisms that are very, very difficult to treat, especially if they become established in patients with significant comorbid diseases. Um, and we've learned now that outbreaks can occur from uh, you know, significantly throughout a hospital or a hospital systems directly from endoscopic transmission. All duodenoscopes from all vendors have to date been implicated. And I'm specifically referring about legacy duodenoscopes. And this is really because, you know, uh, the elevator is the duodenoscope's greatest strength and its Achilles heel, right? For all intents and purposes, we can't do ERCP, not, certainly not the way we're doing it in 2021 without the elevator. Residual body fluids and debris in the vicinity of the elevator and the elevator mechanism have been specifically recognized and implicated as a cause of these infectious transmission events. The complexity of the elevator mechanism makes it difficult to fully assess and clean uh, even by very, very experienced assistants or technicians. But it's also important to stress that there's other potential areas for uh, contamination and infectious transmission uh, most notably inside the main working channel, although there are other places that can allow for bacterial biofilm accumulation and uh, reservoirs for bacterial organisms. In 2015, the FDA ordered manufacturers to carry out post-marketing surveillance studies to examine duodenoscope contamination rates. Um, and then these were uh, released in 2018 and 2019, and they actually showed that there were higher than expected rates of contamination following reprocessing, even if it was done to the highest possible standards. And for example, up to about 6% of devices were found to be colonized uh, with organisms of concern. That's a pretty significant number when you think about the number of ERCPs happening in the United States and around the world. The FDA has since called for uh, duodenoscope uh, designs to be modified to incorporate uh, infectious mitigation strategies or features, including disposable components or endoscopes designed for single use and changes to legacy duodenoscopes to maybe make the elevator mechanism more accessible and perhaps easier to clean. For the rest of the talk, I will focus on technical aspects of duodenoscope design and new duodenoscope models and their contamination mitigation uh, designs and features with a focus on uh, disposable duodenoscopes. 
So, you know, can you build a better mousetrap? That's a fair question, right? We know that repeated high level disinfection has been advocated and adopted by many centers, but unfortunately it doesn't change the underlying structural problems found in legacy or traditional uh, reusable duodenoscopes. Um, some places have talked a lot about ethylene oxide sterilization, which is in fact an option, but it's costly. And here I've, I've generously said may shorten the life of legacy duodenoscopes, but we know that actually it will shorten the life of legacy duodenoscopes due to wear and tail, most notably on gaskets and seals. A variety of uh, duodenoscope modifications have been proposed and some of these have been implemented. Right, you can change existing uh, reusable scopes, you can change future or, or soon to be out reusable scopes, and then you can have disposable duodenoscopes, which is perhaps the greatest area of interest uh, in uh, therapeutics today. Right, so the disposable duodenoscope is obviously the elephant in the room, right? I've said for a couple of years now that these are really ultimate disruptive endoscopic technology. And this is, you know, the idea of having a fully disposable scope is not a new one. This was something that was very widely talked about about a decade ago, and it kind of didn't come to fruition because the, it just kind of wasn't practical at that time. But the urgency from these outbreaks of the duodenoscope uh, transmitted infections, the national attention that they brought, some of the very significant medical legal concerns that were raised uh, in both hypothetical and uh, concrete ways uh, have really uh, pushed this notion of the disposable duodenoscope specifically and disposable endoscopes in general really back to the forefront, as have statements by the FDA. So, you know, there's pros and cons to the notion of a disposable duodenoscope. On the pro side, you know, theoretically, there should be no risk of infectious contamination of the scope because it's being destroyed, no risk of infectious transmission to the patient because it's only being used in one patient. I think many of us are excited by the possibility of a reduced staff requirement, right? Maybe we could theoretically someday in the hypothetical future get to the point where we don't have a scope washer and we don't have a room of scope washers. Maybe that room could someday be turned into a revenue generating procedure room, right? And theoretically, maybe there's a reduced capital equipment requirement, like I said, if you don't have automated endoscope preprocessors. There's also a lot of cons or potential cons about disposable scopes, right? Do they operate as well as the legacy instruments that we have literally been using for decades? Is the image quality is good? Will they hold up, right, in a complex case, right? I always joke that 90% of ERCPs take 10 minutes, but 10% take 90 minutes. You don't know going into a case always, is it going to be a 10-minute case or a 90-minute case, right? Can supply meet demand, right? Todd, David and myself are all very high volume providers, right? Can we get enough of these scopes in our hands to do a full day's work every day? And what happens to all the waste, right? We're living in a, an era where there's intense focus on uh, green technologies and minimization of uh, resources, you know, so what happens to all these scopes, right? When we're done with them, we don't want it to be like in that movie WALL-E where the world is just sort of surrounded by accumulated waste and debris. So that brings us to really the focus of our talk today, which is the AMBU A-scope, uh, also referred to as the A-scope duodeno, right? This is a sterile single-use duodenoscope that was 510 cleared by the FDA in July of 2020, and it uses the A-box, which is the, uh, the processor that goes with it. And the system integrates with your existing monitors and your endoscopy report generator, whatever that is. And this is what it looks like. And some people have seen this in pictures, some people have seen this up close, but some people haven't seen this at all. So at, at first glance, obviously it, it is in some ways similar looking and in other ways, very different looking than a traditional standard uh, duodenoscope. Obviously the first thing you notice is this sort of white color, right? It doesn't look like every other duodenoscope on the market. Um, the, the, the valves also look different if you look at them closely, but again, it has all of the usual controls that we've come to expect from all of our use uh, over the past many years. This is a tip, sorry, this is a photo of the tip of the scope or the so-called business end of the scope. And you can see, obviously, uh, there is an elevator and it sort of has a very typical shape. It has a dynamic flexing tip, right? So again, works with all available ERCP accessories on the market. I'm proud to say that I was uh, honored and privileged to be the first physician to use the AMBU uh, A-scope in a human being in the world. And this is a, a photo from case in the humans number one, and you can see the patient obviously has 
a distal CBD stricture. But what's more important to focus on, right, is that there are some things about the scope that are different on your very, very first uh, glance. One is that the scope is not radio opaque all the way to the tip. And the radio opaque section of the scope stops just before the flexing or bending portion of the tip that typically sits in the C sweep, a sweep of the duodenum. So that does take a little bit of getting used to. The idea behind that was that theoretically the the non-radio opaque part of the scope would overlie the common bile duct, so you'd be able to see the CBD for pretty much its whole way. But it, it does, it, it gives a little bit of a different look. And I remember the first time that I saw it, I kind of had to catch my breath because, you know, you're used to seeing the exact tip of the scope as being radio opaque, so you have to get used to this. You also see sort of all the inner workings of the duodena scope, so it does have a little bit of a a readjustment or a learning curve period as you're, you're seeing in some ways more and in some ways less than you're used to seeing. And again, here, just for completeness sake, here you can see that we replaced a, a metal bili st biliary stent in that patient and everything went well. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, video excerpts from some of the cases that I've done with the A-scope to date, and then we'll break into a more uh, longer Q&A session with Todd, David, and myself. So some of the, before I go into the first case, I wanna emphasize that sometimes what you're gonna be seeing in these cases is not really what um, we want you to focus on, right? So again, it's very easy when you go into case presentations to sort of put yourself in the endoscopy portion of the program, but some things may not be apparent to you and I wanna point them out. So the first thing I'm gonna show is the passage of uh, the duodenoscope in an unedited manner from the mouth uh, to the bulb, right? So again, one of the first things you notice is the aspect ratio of the image is a little bit different, right? It's a little uh, more of a so-called letterbox perspective, right? It's not a typical ERCP aspect ratio, which is typically more square. This is more rectangular. Um, and uh, the images and maybe the color and the, the pixels are just a little bit different than you're used to on modern video duodenoscopes. Here you can see we're sort of wending our way down just about at the entrance to the stomach here. And you know, this video also illustrates sort of what I, the point I was making earlier is that you don't know what's gonna be an easy or a hard case. So I did not pre-select the patients that I use the A-scope in. I just use them in unselected, unsorted patients. Whoever was next on the duty roster got done. And lo and behold, this patient has a high grade stricture at the apex of their duodenal bulb. So again, what was, we thought it was going to be a quick five minute case actually turned out to have a wrinkle. So that was actually good. And that was actually specifically why I did not use the scope and just sort of cherry picked or pre-selected patients. I wanted to see how it would operate in a real world setting. And you can see again, a high grade stricture of the apex of the bulb. So we were able to navigate that. And here we are down in the duodenum. So again, just like in a real case, you got to work your way through that stricture. This patient had a previously placed uh, plastic stent that had been actually left in for quite a long time. Um, again, so your view is very similar to what you're uh, used to. You can operate the scope in all the standard ways that you've been able to operate your legacy scopes for many years. So again, I don't really want you to focus so much on the clinical aspects of the case here. I want you to focus on how the image looks, right? And how it feels like the scope is moving. Right, so again, here we are drifting down to sort of the end of the second, beginning of the third portion of the duodenum. You can see there's a wire in the bile duct already. That's typically my practice is I cannulate and I'll pull the stent out afterwards just to save some time. Uh, and again, I'm doing this just like I would a regular case. And again, I'm not losing my wire position even though I'm drifting down once I've accessed the biliary tree with my wire to go ahead and get that uh, stent out. And again, I wouldn't expect losing the wire to be an issue. It's not a wire with a legacy scope and it wasn't an issue in this case. Second case, again, I wanna show, uh, just so you get a sense of it, another unedited short clip of passing the scope down to the duodenum, everyone's different. This is something that when I talk about this, people really, really wanna see. They wanna see how does the scope pass. So again, I can't put it in your hands, but I can show you sort of an unedited real-time uh, sense of things. And it looks pretty much just like a regular duodenoscope passage. This patient did not have a uh, stricture in the apex of their duodenal bulb that we had to deal with, so that was always nice. And here we are just sort of rounding down, and there we are. And this patient had a fully covered 
metal stent that I had placed about two years previously um, and then was uh, coming in for essentially some elevated bilirubin and alkafos. And the question was, was it tumor ingrowth? Was it stone or debris or, or combination thereof? Here you can see our cannulation. So again, focus on the image quality, focus on the resolution. You can see there's the cutting wire, my uh, sphincter tome just for a small structure that give you a sense of the degree of sharpness and clarity of the image. And here we are uh, just sort of sweeping that out. It turned out it was actually all stone debris and uh, not tumor ingrowth into the stent. And you'll see a full balloon sweep here. And again, focus on the tissue resolution, right? I know you all wanna see what's gonna come out with the sweep, which is what we're all our brains automatically go to, but focus on the tissue resolution of the mucosa here, struts on the metal stent, things like that. I think I may have skipped over it, but there's a bunch of stones and debris that came out of there. And I think we did not place another stent in this case. And then I will just, uh, just jump to the, the third case that I wanna show one clip from, and it's just a metal stent deployment, but I really just wanna show it to emphasize A, how it looks, and B, that we're pretty much doing all the maneuvers we would ordinarily do in a regular case. Um, and this is, for example, a fully covered uh, metal stent deploy using the A-scope. So I'll let that run. Notice that I'm not modifying my technique in any way, right? I'm, I'm, it's sort of like when you, when you buy a new car, you know, the first couple of times you use a new car, you're very aware you're driving a new car. And then after a while, you're just driving to the store, you know, to get something and you're really focused on the actual driving or what else you're going to be doing. And you're not so focused on the scope. And we learned that that was our experience after a learning curve of about three to four scopes with the A scope or procedures. We were really kind of just doing the procedure. And I had fellows with me for these cases and I was not treating them as special. I was treating them as routine cases. And again, I had my fellows doing this right from uh, ground zero with me pretty much after the first one or two procedures just to make sure everything was safe. Um, and they were very, very excited to be using this device themselves. So uh, there we go. So where are we now in 2021? Well, the scope is approved and it's available on a, a limited launch basis. Uh, AMBU is conducting a, a real world uh, study of the A-scope uh, right now. They're, this is from uh, clinicaltrials.gov. They're hoping to have 550 patients enrolled in a prospective non-randomized single arm post-market observational study. Uh, and again, that is uh, open and up and running right now. So just to wrap up, I think legacy Dudina scopes, the scopes that we're all using and I'm still using every day, one way or the other are gonna be a thing of the past. There's lots of different solutions to these issues of Dudina scope related infections that are being evaluated and studied in the United States and around the world. I think that reusable Dudina scopes with removable caps and disposable Dudina scopes are really gonna be the two main foci of future prospective trials. There is a cap device that's available for legacy Dudina scopes that will, I think, be interesting as a short-term option until these other technologies really uh, gain widespread uh, fruition and, and acceptance. Um, like I said, most centers, including my own, are still using legacy, fully reusable Dudina scopes at this time. And I think future study data and endoscopic contract negotiations are likely to accelerate all of this process as we move into uh, more modern uh, solutions. So that is my last slide. I will stop sharing my slides right now and then we can open it up uh, to Dr. Barron and Dr. Lichtenstein as well and the moderator. Thank you so much, Dr. Adler, uh, for giving us your insight on issues of cross-contamination and introducing us to single-use um, duodenoscopes and your experience with the A-scope duodena. Um, right now, we'll move into the panel portion of the webinar. And remember, attendees, um, you can submit your questions using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen at any time. And I'll introduce the two additional panel members now. First, we'll have Dr. Todd Barron. He is a Director of Advanced Therapeutic Endoscopy and Professor of Medicine at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, Dr. Barron received his MD from the University of Florida, 
He completed his internal medicine and gastroenterology training at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He then completed an additional year of fellowship training at pancreatic obiliary endoscopy at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Barron served on the faculty at UAB from 1993 to 98, and then at Mayo Clinic from 1998 to 2013 before joining UNC. Dr. Barron is nationally and internationally recognized for his skills in advanced therapeutic endoscopy. Thanks for being here, Dr. Barron. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dr. David Lichtenstein. He's the Director of Interventional Endoscopy and Professor of Medicine at Boston Medical Center. He received his MD from the University of Pennsylvania and completed internal medicine training at Duke University Medical Center. After finishing a GI fellowship at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, he completed additional fellowship training in interventional endoscopy at Duke University Medical Center and Advanced Pancreatic Obiliary Endoscopy at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Lichtenstein served at, as faculty at Brigham and Women's from 1993 to 96, and then as Director of Endoscopy at Boston Medical Center from 1996 to 2019 before moving into his current position. Dr. Lichtenstein is a nationally and internationally recognized researcher and invited lecturer on advanced endoscopy. Again, thank you, Dr. Lichtenstein. Thank you. Um, so since Dr. Adler has shared his experience with um, the ASCOPE Duodeno, how about um, uh, we'll, we'll go to the other panel members and if you can just provide a short overview of your experience with the, the ASCOPE Duodeno. And Dr. Barron, we'll start with you. Okay. Well, first I wanted to um, um, congratulate uh, Doug on a really excellent presentation because I think he covered a lot of uh, important topics in a short period of time. My uh, experience has been uh, similar to Doug's in that um, I did not have any difficulty in passage of the endoscope at all to the duodenum. Uh, we did mostly um, uh, ASE level one and two cases, uh, but almost all the cases I did were native, native papilla cannulations. Um, we were able to cannulate on all the patients uh, perform sphincterotomy as needed and place either remove stones or place uh, stints, including uh, expandable metal stints. Um, so really my experience has been really um, very similar to what um, Dr. Adler, Adler mentioned in his uh, lecture. Thank, thanks, Dr. Barron. Dr. Lichtenstein, can you give us your uh, first sure. overall impressions? Yes. Sure. I had a very similar experience as well to uh, Todd and Doug in terms of um, unselected uh, use of the uh, A-scope uh, Dudino. Um, I didn't have any issues with passing the scope to the papilla. Uh, cannulation was uh, the same as uh, normal without any failures. In fact, we did. There weren't any failures of any of the cases. Similar to Todd, they were primarily uh, level one and two procedures for uh, stone extraction or uh, stent placement for strictures, plastic, and metal stents. And um, uh, my overall uh, uh, level of satisfaction was uh, was high, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 to the extent that it was uh, better than I even anticipated for the first time I had uh, actually put my hands on any disposable uh, scope for a GI procedure. So um, what I didn't do was altered surgical anatomy procedures or any complex uh, pancreatic uh, disorders with the scope. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much for that. Um, there, there was a question from the, um, speaking of that, I, I suppose, um, there's a question from the, the field. How many percent of procedures do you think can be performed with the ASCOPE duodena? Is it fair to assume that some complex procedures still may at this time need a legacy duodena scope? Dr. Adler, let's start with you on that. Um, so it's a good question. I think the real answer is we don't know, right? We, I think we, we are, we're still very early in our experience. Um, and like, I, I did not, um, cherry pick, like I said, and I did do some pancreatic cases. I think two of my cases, 
uh, or sort of complex chronic pancreatitis cases. But again, like David said, that's not the same as altered anatomy. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's perhaps one of the central questions where we are right now. Uh, I was able to get everything done in all the cases I used it in, but I think we will need uh, more long-term data from a larger number of patients and a larger number of operators before we can give a definitive answer on if you can use it in every case. Some cases require, you know, complex maneuverings and, you know, difficult positionings, and we'll just have to see. I mean, I think I'm very, very optimistic by everything I've seen and experienced, but, you know, time will, time will inform us a lot. Uh, I agree. I agree. Um, th thanks for your, thanks for that answer. Um, Dr. Lichtenstein, how about you? I echo what Doug said. I mean, just like driving a new car, I haven't really tested this under all weather conditions with all the turns and twists that can occur in some of the more complex uh, anatomic uh, situations. So I am optimistic that it can do the vast majority or overwhelming majority of ERCPs that, uh, that are necessary, but there's probably a select few where it would still be a requirement um, to have the backup of a reusable uh, duodenoscope, although that may not be necessary with future iterations and advances of the uh, the uh, the uh, the A-scope, uh, recognizing that it's an early iteration of uh, of what will likely change as well in the future. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Barron. Yeah, I, I yeah I agree. We have to see. I mean, as it currently stands. Um, I would say if you ask me, all, all comers, uh, non-selected, as Doug mentioned, in their practice such as mine that has really advanced cases, I would say the number would probably be about 80 to 85%. Um, and um, one thing that I'd like to see, um, just to be completely honest, is that um, I'm, I'm a short guide wire user, but I don't use dedicated short wire systems. Um, I would like to have something that can hold the wire in the elevator that would be helpful for me um, since I don't use, again, a lot of dedicated short wire um, instruments. I like to use the traditional catheter, for example, cannulation with a guide wire that goes to the center of it. Um, but again, short wire um, and the, the legacy scope that I use is, to, you know, has the ability to hold the wire. So that's something that if somebody is sort of using the, or do, performing cases like mine, they would have to um, at least go to long wire for some of their, um, you know, their cases. So, um, which Doug, you probably use uh, short wire specific devices. So I don't know if you want to. I, I use short wire specific devices, but I also almost maybe ninety five percent of cases I'm using two five wires also. So mm -hmm. you know it's it's also you want to make sure it holds all wires in all settings too. Yeah, I agree. I had uh, similarly. I I like an O two five short wire system, and that uh, will require some upgrade to be able to do that uh, without uh, additional uh, holding device. Okay, thank, thanks for, for all your answers on that. And um, so as, as we move forward, uh, AMBU moves forward in different iterations, um, it's probably something that they're looking at to do. Um, how do you feel about um, single use endoscopy and the ability to make such fast iterations in, in technology as compared to the reusables that are out there now that are often, you know, five years or more before you have something different. I mean, um, we hope, we certainly hope and expect that, that um, as not only the advanced really upper echelon key leaders uh, provide feedback, but also um, the community physicians, um, because they're, they're, you know, we all have the same goals in terms of uh, achieving procedural success, but um, obviously we all have a little bit of different approaches. And I think that um, certainly if, if the company can um, get those, that feedback and really change uh, pretty much on the fly, you would think that the technology really should um, go quickly you know, to get us um, next level, next level, next level. So that's an optimist. That's yeah. very, 
Yeah, I'm optimistic mm-hmm. about that. And we've already seen some modifications, you know, since summer of 2020 to, you know, end of 2020, early 2021, we've already seen some modifications based on end operator feedback. So some of which is my own, and I'm sure some of which was Todd's and David. So, I mean, that's that's amazing in terms of response rate. Yeah, I, I think that is an advantage for single-use duodenoscopes. Uh, the legacy reusable duodenoscopes um, that are, have a purchase price of maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 aren't going to be able to adapt as rapidly for a, uh, maybe a three-month or so turnaround time to integrate some of the newer technologies. And so that, that is a potential advantage of single-use that there can be modifications made in a short order. Okay, great. Great. Let's go ahead and keep with you, Dr. Lichtenstein. Um, why are s- single-use endoscopes important to you and to your hospital? Um, the, I mean, the main reason is that we previously for a long time didn't recognize that we could introduce exogenous source infections to our patients until we came up, until we recognized the uh, outbreaks that occurred internationally in the uh, like 2014 and subsequent two or three years. I mean, in total, there have been about 19 US outbreaks, six reported peer reviewed literature and 13 uh, publicly disclosed and another seven or so international outbreaks uh, leading to uh, hundreds of documented infections and at least 20 reported deaths. So in an effort to try to reduce the risk of these uh, exogenous uh, infectious transmissions. The FDA issued a statement back in August of 2019 encouraging uh, medical facilities to transition away from our traditional fixed end cap duodenoscopes to these newer design features, which would include disposable tip technology as well as the uh, disposable sterile duodenoscopes. So, recognizing that we have an opportunity to eliminate another source of adverse events for our patients undergoing complex procedures. It's it's advantageous for us to choose uh, between or have a a, uh, mixture of uh, new technologies, which includes the single use duodenoscopes. Yeah, well said. Thanks. Um, Dr. Adler, you wanna, any more comments on that? No, I mean, I I think I agree with what David said. I mean, we're all navigating this new world. Like like I said, I I believe that these duodenoscope and endoscope infectious transmission events were probably happening all along and we just didn't know it or nobody put it together. And, you know, we've all had a very rude awakening by reading articles in the journal and unfortunately the newspaper about these infectious issues. So obviously, first and foremost, it's a patient safety issue. But, you know, people are very, very worried about other aspects of this. And really, I mean, I think everybody is highly motivated to eliminate these infectious transmission events for a lot of reasons. Great. Dr. Barron. Yeah, I'd also like to add that that when we think of endoscope um, contamination, we sort of think about just the, the, the patient that may get it um, but there's a lot of other things to think about, right? We think about the stress right now that we're putting on technicians, for example, um, that are being watched very, very carefully about what they do. And there's a high uh, level, I think, of dissatisfaction amongst uh, technicians who generally are not paid a lot of money, but yet they're expected to uh, perform at levels that are going to be, you know, 100% safe. And I think that's you know certainly one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is that at an institution like ours, there's actually a village of people behind the scenes that are monitoring scopes, right? So they're they're culturing and they're watching and they're um, you know there's so there's a whole element of uh, person power and uh, money that goes into the whole monitoring process. Again, we just think of uh, a finite. Yes, you know you get infection. But there's a lot of things that are really behind the scenes that um, go into, at least at our university, um, and look in these things. So, um, you know, there's a peace of mind, I think, that comes with, um, with completely knowing that you have an endoscope that, that has no risk of infection as well. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways you can look at the whole process. Well said, all. Um, it's... it's- the big picture of everything. Um, Doctor, we'll stay with you, um, Dr. Barron. 
Um, Dr. Adler mentioned that elevator was the Achilles heel um, of an endoscopes and the cross contamination. And there's a lot of talk about um, the elevator and the disposable tips. But how, wh what are your views on the other sources or other areas of the scope that, that can um, be contaminated as well? Yeah, yeah, certainly that we know that um, when you pass accessories down channels, they create uh, damage. Uh, when you're pulling stints through channels, you create damage. Um, and when those uh, things happen, the nooks and crannies and crevices and things like that, um, you can deposit, uh, you know, bacteria and bacterial biofilm in these areas uh, that can be hard to completely uh, clean. And once they become um, contaminated, there are some that believe that, you know, it's possible that you can't really ever get to those areas and get them all the way back. So, um, you know, I, I think we don't know 100%. Um, what the, con the contributors are, the, the, like you said, the main focus has really been on the elevator, uh, but a lot of us think more broadly of the entire device. Yeah, I mean, right. the, the path of focus is on, you know, disinfection, which isn't the same thing as sterilization. Right. Yeah, like, like uh, Todd was mentioning, um, it's really not just the elevator, although a lot of the focus and the... Um, has been on the complexity of the elevator and the difficulties with uh, achieving adequate uh, cleaning and reprocessing of that site. If we look at some of the surveillance culture studies addressing uh, the presence of a ready-to-use scope with, uh, with culture positivity, um, in maybe a third or more of the uh, instances where there were high concern organisms cultured from the uh, duodenoscope, they occurred outside of the elevator system. Some of them in the uh, accessory channel and there have been bore scope studies where you stick down a little scope, almost like a spyglass type scope into the uh, accessory channel and in some instances you can identify scratches and divots and areas where potentially there's a, a nidus for biofilm formation which Todd mentioned can be difficult if not impossible to eliminate once it's established and so the you know how often should we be doing um, inspections of our uh, duodenoscopes how, who should be doing it um, for the reusables, there, there are going to be issues outside of the elevator. So just creating a distal end cap device, although we do welcome uh, you know, clinical data to, to determine how much protection and how, how much of a reduction that we might see in terms of the contamination, there's likely to be a residual unaddressed uh, uh, contamination issue due to the other complex components of duodenoscopes. I think what's interesting in the borescope studies, David, is how it didn't take that many uses before they started to see signs of wear and tear. I mean, again, it's not surprising. Like, I mean, we subject these scopes to yeah. what can only be described as tremendous mechanical forces. But it's, yeah, it's, when, that was the thing. When I read some of the borescope studies, that was mm -hmm. what to me. Yeah, I think when you start to pass some of the devices like mechanical lithotriptors and things, they create gener they generate large forces with the oh, potential to do damage uh, with the scope. The other thing- Pulling that, out plastic stents. Too. Yeah, pulling back stents, which um, which you wouldn't be concerned about with a single use scope, but you might be with a reusable since that may be one of the mechanisms where you're bringing a dirty uh, stent back into the elevator mechanism and the accessory channel. In my view, that may be one of the reasons why we've seen less of an issue, although it's certainly not a non-issue for EUS scopes. In general, when we're doing therapeutics mm -hmm. with EUS scopes, we're pushing into cysts oh, and, right. and putting needles out of the scope, whereas with ERCP, we're pulling debris and stents into the scope, which is probably exposing it to a lot more contamination. That's, that's just a theory, but I, I mean, that's, uh, that's one of the ways I think about why two elevator scopes may have differences in terms of contamination. And the other thing that Todd alluded to with um, the, um, the scope reprocessors, there's a huge human factor that goes into the issue of uh, providing a, um, a sterile uh, duodenoscope or a scope that has a low likelihood for contamination 
and uh, studies, even the ones that was uh, mandated by the FDA to the duodenoscope manufacturer, it showed a, an alarming rate of uh, scopes uh, that were reprocessed with steps uh, missed in the uh, in the reprocessing stages. Corey Offset from Minneapolis has done studies and recognized that probably only about two percent of um, of the uh, scopes that were reprocessed actually. Uh, went through every um, uh, step that was uh, mandated by the manufacturers. In fact, the process is so complex. I went through one of the uh, manufacturers, uh, M MIFUs, the manufacturer instructions for use. There are actually over 140 individual steps for reprocessing of a duodenoscope. So when you take individuals that may not have had adequate training, they may be rushed during the day due to the rapid turnover of, of scopes. There's high staff turnover. Um, you can understand why it would be uh, fairly uh, uh, easy for a, um, a, uh, a, a, a reprocessing of a scope to have uh, misses in terms of uh, various steps of the reprocessing uh, effort. I mean, at a lot of institutions, you know, the, the techs wash the scopes tech is not a long-term position. People stay one to two years, often then moving on to other schooling or other jobs. So you're, you know, you're often getting the newest person in the entire lab being handed mm -hmm. one of the most absolutely mission critical jobs there is. Yeah, two of the biggest areas that um, introduced a, a level of, uh, of contamination were inadequate uh, mechanical cleaning, which is the most important step before the disinfection both at the bedside pre-cleaning and then the, uh, the cleaning right before the scope goes into the AER. And, and I, I think uh, there's a potential for uh, inadequate uh, cleaning and pre-cleaning for some of the off-hour cases that occur in GI endoscopy programs. Some of those late night or overnight or weekend cases where it's important to have some sort of a process set up with your central cleaning, your CPD to make sure that that doesn't uh, get neglected with the scope sitting overnight. Also, the, the big area was the failure to dry the scope adequately. We know that biofilm formation is um, uh, it's conducive uh, in a wet environment. And so inadequate drying or hanging and storage of scopes can lead to a, a higher rates of biofilm formation and contamination. Th thanks guys, that was a great exchange. Uh, all good to hear. Um, uh, Dr. Barron, uh, Dr. Lichtenstein mentioned um, studies several different times. Is there any study in particular that stands out to you that has pushed you towards single use or? No, I don't think it was one particular study. I think uh, certainly colleagues that I know well um, in the West Coast um, that really, um, you know, I'm close to some people there that were at the ha heart of the problem. And, um, and so that really brought a lot of it to my attention um, several years ago. Great. Uh, how about you, Dr. Adler? I think it's sort of more... I don't think it's any one study, but I think it was very much how this, you know, this topic went from zero to hero. Like we went from never thinking about it at all to thinking about it all the time, multiple studies coming out across multiple journals, emergency meetings at the hospital, meetings with infectious disease and infection control. I think it was the rapidity with which this became a pressing issue that grabbed everybody. And Dr. Lichtenstein, Stein, uh, similarly, like not one study, but just a, a conglomeration of several studies with the mm -hmm. same theme, highlighting that we're probably underreporting transmission of infections with ERCP, largely because we're the organisms that are being transmitted are generally normal gut flora and would not be recognized outside of the outbreaks that occurred with the multi-drug resistant organisms. Some of these infections are at distant sites away from the biliary tree. There can be a long lag time of months between exposure and infection. The common to have a silent carrier states and the duodenoscopes after it's been recognized that there was infection transmission or by that time often culture negative. And so the probably the like some of the more important studies though were the 
the post-marketing surveillance studies from the FDA, which was somewhat alarming that up to five or six percent from all the vendors had uh, post-reprocessing colonization with high concern organisms. And then some of the work at at some of the sites where they actually dealt with outbreaks, uh, they were able to reduce the rate of contamination. For instance, Sandy Ross's group at Virginia Mason, where post outbreak, they had contamination rates close to 2%. But even with introduction of um, culture and quarantine reprocessing protocol, pulling out of circulation, persistently colonized duodenoscopes, identifying and repairing occult defects after bore scope examination, introducing some enhanced cleaning protocols at the elevator, and making sure that the reprocessing staff were adhering to human factors for the IFUs. They were, I mean, they made a dramatic improvement down to 0.3%, but that still means that three out of a thousand duodenoscopes are going into subsequent patients with some of somebody else's bacteria and potentially introducing a risk for infection. In fact, if you do a calculation from all the outbreaks that occurred, the attack rate, which is essentially what the likelihood of transmitting a bacteria from a contaminated scope to a patient undergoing a subsequent ERCP is about 20%. So if we take a range of contamination of duodenoscopes from 0.2 to about 5%, um, which is reasonable. I just did a quick calculation the other day, and that would translate into a risk of ERCP bacterial transmission with high concern organisms in a range of about one in 106 for the 5% contamination rate to about one in 2,362 for the 0.2% rate. So that's sort of the, uh, to put things into perspective, that's sort of the range of what we're transmitting, I believe, in terms of bacteria from one patient to another with our uh, technology prior to distal tip replaceable pipe replacements or the single use devices. That is great information. It sounds like you've done some homework on here. Hey, you really have. Um, I thought about it, yeah. <laughs> just, just a little. A little bit. Um, yeah. Um, so we've got a question from the audience. Um, were your infection control department's big drivers for adoption of the single use um, duodenoscope? And we'll, we'll go ahead and stay with you, Dr. Lichtenstein, and we'll move throughout the panel. Um, tell you the truth, that they were not. In fact, um, it was, I brought it to their attention that there was op- alternatives with single use duodenoscopes or the new distal tip uh, duodenoscopes. Um, we did several years ago after the outbreaks, though, with the MDR uh, organisms, we did develop a group within the institution that was addressing the issues of endoscope reprocessing. And it, uh, it's typical of other institutions that have crossed multiple disciplines with infection control, environmental services, ID, CPD, endoscopy. And once um, I became aware of some of the newer technologies, I did... Uh, bring it to the attention of the group and it did un- undergo um, discussion and ultimate uh, approval at the at the institution but <clears throat> it was really the GI group that initiated the process. Good information. Dr. Adler? Yeah I, I think it was similar. We had sort of like a tiger team at the university where you know that a bunch of us physicians, nurse managers, infectious disease, etc. Uh, were sort of got together and made some of our initial changes, but, you know, infectious disease doctors, they don't read GI journals. They certainly don't read endoscopy journals. So, you know, they, they were not aware of these disposable duty and scope technologies until we brought it to them. So, uh, you know, again, you know, we don't read their journals, they don't read ours. So I'm not surprised that they didn't know, but it was sort of interesting. Like they, they had no idea that this was even a possibility. Yeah. Dr. Barron. Yeah, well, it's really actually the opposite. I wouldn't say that they uh, were the main drivers, but they have been cer- certainly um, the infectious disease program here had a really big interest um, and still does in, in endoscope um, uh, infections. And so when I got here seven years ago, they were, um, you know, they, they were already monitoring scopes and doing all these things. And they um, have been aware of this and on the cutting edge and some have actually written 
uh, things in the New York Times that were here from my institution. So um, and and so they if if you ask them they would they be they would tell you absolutely this is the best thing that that we can think of um, is is to to go with something that has zero risk. So that they they think you know they're very supportive. Great. Z zero risk sounds great. <laughs> um, you know, what I always say is, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it couldn't happen in my lab. Uh, not, not where I work, right? It, it could happen to you. Like it could happen to any of us up here. It could happen to anyone. Yeah. And I, I would say, even though we might not have had an outbreak at our institution, I'm sure I, there's been a subclinical transmission of an exogenous infection at some time in my career, but I just didn't know about right. it because it was normal normal flora from the, from the gut. All right. I think everyone, you know, if you do enough ERCP, you'll have the experience of where you remove a small stone and then you're looking in the duodenum for it because you want to take a photo because patients love to see their stones and, and you don't find it. And then you, you know, it, it must be behind the elevator. And then, you know, when the case is done, you hand the scope off and the washer tells you 10 minutes later, the stone was fully behind the elevator like that's a very eye-opening experience if, if a stone can get trapped back there certainly bacteria can right and luckily you had a, a staff member that was trained trained well enough to find that right, right. look yep <clears throat> um dr baron we'll we'll start with you on this one um dr adler mentioned taking the cleaning room and turning it into a room that potentially generates revenue. And you mentioned the impact on the staff. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that single use duodenoscope is the first of many single use scopes to come? And is this the future? Well, certainly if, if you want to think about, um, let's say we, we only had duodenoscopes, you obviously couldn't get rid of the reprocessing room, right? Because you have, all the other scopes to deal with. Um, if if every every scope went to single use, uh, like you said, you could essentially eliminate any reprocessing in the unit whatsoever. Um, and I think you know we're probably at the very tip of what's what's happening in terms of the uh, momentum. And I don't know how rapid it, it, the adoption and acceleration of it's going to be. I do believe. Uh, and I have said the same thing that uh, the Doug has said, that ultimately, um, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, we probably will all be using um, single-use devices or endoscopes. Um, it happened when you saw it in the accessories. I remember when I started, when David started, uh, we used to reuse all of our accessories. We used to use our sphincter tones until they broke. We would reuse our baskets until they broke. And, you know, we don't do that, right? There's a reason we don't do that. So I think it's going to get there. I can't predict, you know, how quickly, but I think it will go there. And at that point, obviously, you're eliminating an entire um, part of your, um, you know, where your focus is for employees, for all the, uh, the cost of um, uh, the solutions, the process, reprocessing, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's, you know, that would be a, a definitely a win for the endoscopy unit. Uh, I'll agree. Um, Dr. Adler, do you have uh, anything to say on that? Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, uh, you know, this is not a static uh, marketplace. And, you know, there's going to be all, there's a lot of vendors in this space and there's a lot of different technologies I, I think it'll be interesting to see. I don't know if we're going to be all disposable or the, or if, or not. I, I think time will tell. I don't know if I could say just yet. How do you feel about that question, Dr. Lichtenstein? I knew you'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a trend, I was right? trying to get past that it's one. It's a trend. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, I really, uh, similarly, uh, I mean, that's, I don't know. I mean, I, I wish I did. Um, I don't know what the magnitude of uh, contamination is with upper and, and colonoscopes relative to duodenoscopes. I think if, the, if we uh, demonstrate a similar issue, then there's going to be more momentum to switching to single-use uh, scopes across the whole spectrum. Um, 
I echo what uh, Todd had mentioned too. We sort of trained around the same time at Duke and we did, we used uh, paplatomes maybe four or five times till they broke and wires and everything got reprocessed. And then the momentum changed for medical legal issues and recognizing that there was some added risk and ultimately um, we're where we are today with uh, single use accessories and, and the same sort of momentum, but on a bigger scale with economics that are maybe a little bit more challenging are, um, are going to drive it. But it's, if it does happen, it's going to take a longer period of time. And that's largely the economics. We're talking about accessories that may cost dollars versus scopes that cost tens of thousands of dollars. And so um, right. we need the financial assessments for combining reprocessing and the personnel for reprocessing, the space that's allocated and the overall uh, impact uh, for costs and environmental issues. And when you put all that together, my my gut says we're driving in that direction, but to the time period it takes to get there, I don't know. Right. Um, I know Dr. Adler in his presentation said that, you know, at first it looked impractical to have a single use do it in a scope. Um, and, and now, now that is on the market. Um, are there any other sorts of innovations that you want to see from a, um, single use endoscope company? Uh, go ahead and start with, keep with you, Dr. Lichtenstein. Sure. Um, if it doesn't have to specifically relate to the single use market, although it could be, I'd like to see integration of other technologies within single use instruments. And my main focus, at least initially, would be the uh, AI integration. I'd love to see technology integrated into all the scope platforms for areas that have uh, undergone uh, uh, some uh, preliminary work that are uh, awaiting FDA approval, like improving polyp detection to improve ADRs, polyp characterization, uh, bar de determining Barrett's dysplasia, reading our capsule endoscopies, um, determining segmental IBD activity, automating the whole QI process so that as we're scoping, there we can have uh, automation calculating ADR bowel prep scores that are automatically put into our reporting systems, automated photo taking of pathology, um, colonoscopes that'll tell us the percent of mucosal surface area that we examine. So in real time, they can tell us if we went around a turn or missed behind a fold and need to examine that area better. And so that, that's the sort of integration I'd love to see. And I think there's a lot more there. You're more nimble and more mobile in the single use space to be able to make uh, integrations and changes um, a lot faster than maybe with the uh, conventional legacy scopes. Right. I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, Dr. Adler, how about you? Uh, I kind of have some strong feelings on this. Um, and I, I, I've said this before in a couple of contexts. I think that we have to really look at ergonomics. I think that, you know, when these, uh, when endoscopes, BG scopes, colonoscopes, when these were scopes were developed, if you did three scopes in a day, you were considered a high volume endoscopist, right? Now, you know, you're looking at people like the three of us who are doing procedures all day, every day for years and years and years. And, you know, just like there's now a real awareness about infectious transmission, there's a real awareness about endoscope related injuries. So I think maybe this is our chance to, to redesign the scopes. That's a good point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Dr. Barron? No, I don't really have much, much to add. I mean, um, certainly um, I, what I, you know, because I'm a, a therapeutic endoscopist, of course, um, what will be interesting, I guess, to see is, you know, do we see the same thing with echo endoscopy, um, which, you know, obviously you have the same concerns, even maybe more so, or as much so because we're violating lots of sterile spaces. Um, and that's, that's the biggest thing. If you step back for a second about infection is that with the RCP, they got all the intention is we're, we're violating otherwise um, sterile spaces. Right. And, um, and we're doing that more and more and more uh, as we push the envelope with, with therapeutic endoscopy, which includes, you know, therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound of 
capillary drainage and et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see if, if we integrate into that area as well. Okay. Nice. Nice. Um, so we are on the hour, uh, one minute past. So let me ask um, one more question here in respect of everybody's time and then we'll, um, we'll sign off. But um, Dr. Adler mentioned in his um, presentation again that he thought three to four procedures was the learning curve that he needed um, to, to move forward with um, the single use Ascope Duodeno. Um, is there anything to add on that, Dr. Adler? Is that for you think for you as an advanced um, guy in a big institution or your fellows or? Um... Well, I, I'll tell you one thing that was unexpected that did take a little getting used to is the scope is quiet. You know, we're used to the sound of the scope. Like the sound is kind of part of the pre-flight check. Like, you know, that the scope is operating, a legacy scope is operating based on its sound, but the the A-scope has a different sound and it's mostly an absence of sound. It's much quieter. And I, I remember like that, that was uh, something that I had to kind of like remind myself, like everything was okay. It just, it, it does sound different and uh, people should be prepared for that. Yes. I, I have heard that. And I've heard yeah. That. I, I was surprised. Yeah. It's like a car with a muffler on it. It makes no sound. The vacuum, usually the suction creates a lot of noise and in, in the room it was quiet. I had asked people if they turned the suction on for the procedure, but um, I would agree with Doug. It's a really rapid uptake as far as the ability to, to uh, perform at least the um, level one and two procedures, which are the predominant ones that yeah. I've used it for. Uh, even on the first ERCP that I used, although I was uh, like looking at the screen and evaluating the imaging and the maneuverability around the pill, I was able to accomplish everything I wanted to even on the first procedure, although there was some subtle differences as there would be even if I changed from one legacy scope from one vendor to another legacy scope. There's going to be some adaptation that's going to be required from a change of scope, regardless of whether it's single use or a reprocessable scope. And so I was surprised at the uh, ease and uh, of transition. But again, I haven't tested it in um, some of the more challenging circumstances like altered anatomy or some of the very complex cases with intrahepatic stone lithotripsy and spyglass type uh, procedures at this stage. I think I think that the um, uh, the learning curve really it, it, it's probably going to be somewhat individualistic, right? I mean, the three of us have a fairly um, similar experience in how quickly we were able to to, to change. Uh, but you know, mindful of the fact that we've been doing this for a long period of time at a high volume, uh, given the number of procedures. So I, I don't want people to get a false sense um, that it would be two or three for them. Um, in fact, what I would say is that if you're going to try it, you need to give it enough time where you, you feel comfortable. Because as, as David mentioned, I, I've gone through and used predominantly one, one um, legacy scope for my entire career. But at times, um, I've had institutions say, hey, we're going to trial such and such as uh, scope and you, just to see what it's like and maybe get pricing and whatnot. And it, it is different, even, even with another um, reusable endoscope. And so I, I think that's a good point because people will say, oh, it's different because it's not what I'm used to using, but that's true regardless of what scope you're going to go to because they're all a little bit different amongst duodenal scopes. Yeah, it raises your blood pressure a little bit to use a new device. Right. Or an unfamiliar device. Right. Great. Great. Guys, so um, we're going to conclude the presentation now. Um, Dr. Adler, Dr. Barron, Dr. Lichtenstein, Really appreciate your input. Some great information here um, that I hope everyone was able to glean and, and, and take back with them. Um, we appreciate you guys' time and um, hope to see you soon. Um, I want to remind everybody in the audience that there is an upcoming event on May the 6th that you can register for now using the app. And that's the role of GI endoscopy in surgery with Dr. Reginald Bell. And that's going to be coming up on May the 6th. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Hey, Thanks, thank Mark. you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Dave. Good to see all you guys. Good night.